there is a random feel to the city. Each night secrets are revealed. Promises are broken. So many ways to live and to die. The way I got involved with the show is they sent me the script. I read the script very, very quickly and really wanted to play the part. And then the next step was to meet with Michael Connolly and Eric Obermeyer and the producers. And for whatever reason, um, every time I scheduled a meeting, something happened and I wasn't able to make the meeting. One time I was getting on a train to go to New York from my house in Connecticut and my phone was stolen, so I had to cancel the, the meeting. And then I was shooting Transformers at the same time, which meant that I was all over the United States and, and eventually finishing the film in Hong Kong. So we kept missing each other. And, and I got very anxious at one point and said to my manager that I guess this is not to be because we can't, we can't get together. And he said, I think that boat has sailed. I know that they've, been, they've tested some people. And, and then serendipity worked out. And in between uh, locations, I was in LA for a short period of time. I was able to meet with those guys. I met with them and it all worked out. And so I got the got the role, was thrilled to get it, and then had a very short period of time to sort of ultimately prepare. So en route to Hong Kong on the airplane, I read the three novels that we were going to be using for the first season, specifically uh, City of Bones for the for the pilot episode, and um, then came back and two days of kind of decompressing with horrible jet lag from Hong Kong and started to film the pilot. So some of it was really kind of jumping in, for lack of a better word, and organically kind of letting the character, uh, those chips fall where they may. And, and so, but I was fortunate that the character, the sort of core central values of the character are very clearly established in the books and as well in the script. And so didn't have to make anything up or go crazy and try to sort of change him and make him cooler or sexier or something that just sort of, I mean, that's what's interesting about him is that he's a real person. He's just kind of, I mean, look at me. I'm not, I'm not Brad Pitt. <laughs> there you are, Pitt. we can touch you. I'm not, yeah, I'm not Brad Pitt. Um, more Bruce Willis right now with this haircut. <laughs> I would say, yeah, yeah, pretty, pretty much so. It kind of came out of the box and it did well, and so we we found out fairly quickly. Everybody in my family and everyone surrounding me knew that the show had been picked up two weeks before I did, and, and they were sworn to secrecy because it they wanted to Roy Price, the head of Amazon Studios, and Michael Connolly and our producer Henrik Bastin wanted to surprise me for my birthday. Okay. So. It was a huge family That's conspiracy. Nice. My children have not received their allowance since. And my wife is, uh, I'm still not speaking to her. And uh, so it was a tremendous surprise having a, at my, uh, at a surprise birthday party, no less, that my wife threw for me, my first surprise party. Roy Price, head of Amazon Studios, said, so the show is doing well and we're very happy. And I went, great, great. There was that lull in the conversation that was sort of uncomfortable. Yeah. I mean, you know, if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything. And he said, very nonchalantly, so we're going to obviously continue and move forward with season two. And I was so, at that point, um, detached from the conversation that I went, yeah, yeah, good, good, good. And then it landed on me. <laughs> and I went, what? what? Yeah. And I thought they were t kind of taking the piss out of me a little bit. And it turned out they weren't. Michael Connolly, you know, he grabbed me and hugged me and, it was a, and we did a little jig. I did a little jig. They, they, they did a jig. They, oh, well, they did jig the weeks before. You did it for them. So I had a late jig. Yeah. <laughs> it down, all right. But yeah, I was thrilled. And so here we are in the second season. And, and it's a whole different ball game. And same guy, but very, very different circumstances and very uh, the highest of stakes that you can possibly imagine for a character. There's a bit of that. The thing that becomes profoundly personal is the fact that he's up against the Armenian-Russian mob 
and which places Harry's ex-wife and his daughter in harm's way. And so, unbeknownst to them, mm -hmm. thinking that, you know, any sort of normal, rational human being would sort of take that as a, a that, that leverage would be used to back him off. Um, what it does is that he, he kind of ceases to become a cop and decides to, he, he goes a bit off the reservation. And I, and I think for the audience and the fans of Bosch, they will see a side of Harry that might alarm them a little bit. They kind of go, oh, but it's, what's good is that it's a glimpse into the person that he probably was before he was a cop when he was in the military. He has to resort to that skill set that, that he had, which, you know, for anyone who's been a special forces operator, that's kind of, there's a muscle memory there. But it, you don't want that switch to get flipped in a guy like that, and they kind of flip the switch, and God help his tormentors. It goes off the rails a yeah. bit, doesn't it? Yeah. I practiced it. I took the civil <laughs> service exam oh, did you? to be a cop and then realized that perhaps maybe the pay as an actor might be better and the bullets were fake. So it seemed to be, yeah, but I think, you know, to a certain degree, that's the uh, that's the training ground, all the make-believe you do when you're a little boy being cops and robbers and cowboys and Indians and army guys. And, yeah, I had no formal training except the playground in the woods in my backyard. No, that's not true. I do as much as I possibly can. Yeah. Um, some of the stuff, just for the sake of safety, mm -hmm. um, you have to be a little bit careful because if we get injured, that's not good. It's not good if an, a stunt man gets injured, but uh, either. But they're a bit more well versed in proximity to explosions and how to react. Mm -hmm. But uh, there's not a lot of stunt work to do. I mean, it really it was. There was a bit of running, which which. I was, I, was, I was okay, I was okay with that. Um, yeah, but yeah, most of what you see, it's us, us doing it. Anyone lays a hand on my family, and I'll kill you all. You know, our show is very, very steep in reality. I mean, you have, of course, the, the stakes, the circumstances have to be high enough so that they're compelling for an audience to want to continue to watch. Mm -hmm. um, but it's it's not Transformers, so we're not gonna have, the explosions are gonna be grounded in a kind of reality. Um, the driving of the vehicles, if you have a foot pursuit, they're grounded in reality, but I think that that's what makes them, they're, they're clumsy, right? It's like fights and things like that, real fights in the world, or it's not like, Harrison Ford, you know, when he Indiana Jones, he gets hit in the face with a stick and, and then kicked and punched. Perfect. He's coming back. <laughs> yeah. There's a little cut here or there. I mean, the immediacy of that violence is is accurately depicted in our show. If somebody gets hit in the face, they're gonna go on the you ground. See it. Yeah. I think. Look. The any pursuit of uh, of an artistic career, be it. Uh, one in acting or being a painter, a fine artist, or a musician. Mm -hmm. it's a, it is a long road that has no shortcuts and certainly no turns. And so if one decides that that's their career path, you better love it. You better do it because it's, it's that which you live for. Because if not, um, there, there is a considerable amount of disappointment and a lot of hard work and a lot of holding your head down and it's not glamorous and it's not cool. Um, the, the great payoff is that hopefully eventually you are able to make a modicum of a decent living doing that which you love, which gets you up in the morning and in that way I'm very, very grateful that, that I'm able to do that. You know, I, I would say some of the some of the better advice was to not show up on time, but be early, um, <laughs> which I think is important. Yeah. And be prepared, always be prepared. Don't show up not knowing your lines. Um, I don't know who established that as being some sort of vogue, cool thing. Oh, someone established that. Um, but I see it with, with some frequency, and I'm always sort of astounded, because to me, it, it, uh, it's a complete 
an utter lack of respect for that which we do as actors and also for the crew you know there's uh, a couple hundred people and everyone is working very hard and it means time away from your family and your loved ones and and so one should get the work completed and do it to the best possible you know level of their ability and excellence and and then go home and, and be be with your family and be with your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your wife, your husband, Those whoever, people, your yeah. kids, of course. Um, but just respect the process, respect that which you do, mm -hmm. and have a little pride in your ownership. But yeah, showing up early makes a big difference in being prepared. So show up <laughs> early, know your lines, or I'll kick your ass. <laughs> if you're on my show, I don't I let that, do that. I don't I let that slide. <laughs> I don't let that slide. There, I would hope, I would hope my fingers are crossed. I mean, because of the wealth of material that we have, you could, one could feasibly do this for up until the books. And yeah. The latest book, The Crossing, Harry is now 63 years old and has just retired from LAPD. But, so you have that, and I think Harry is a character who, unlike a lot of people who retire, he'll never fully retire. He's a guy who will always be that detective, that part of him. It's so much of who he is. And he's constantly in a state of observation that I have to imagine that he'd be a guy who'd have a very difficult time retiring. So uh, there's that, and then by creating this universe, even if we ran out of the books in four seasons. Which is quite some time. <laughs> yeah, there's enough, there's enough uh, of, of a world created with the show now um, and a sense of the character that we, we could, you know, Eric Obermeyer said an interesting thing. Somebody said, well, when would, when would you, Harry Bosch, stop? And, and Eric said, never. Harry Bosch just goes on and goes on and goes on and on and on, which is kind of, which is kind of true. And then we should hope that there's a Harry Bosch somewhere, everywhere, and everywhere. Right, and then, no, when I'm too old to do it, then Someone, well. Harry Bosch, the early years. <laughs> and they'll get some young, dashing, strapping, good-looking guy to play Harry Bosch, and then people can watch it chronologically and go, yeah, the older Harry Bosch is not quite as cute as the <laughs> What are you going to do? But it's wisdom. But it's, yeah, yeah, it's wisdom. Very good. Yeah, right. that's what I say. You don't get this color hair at the, at the salon. This is, uh, this is three children. <laughs> Well, if they even if they haven't seen the first season, yeah, um, I, I just think it's very compelling storytelling, and the writing is very very good. And this is a character that I think is very attainable to audiences because he's a he's a real antihero. He, he's there's a humanity about him. I mean, yes, he's tough. He's a guy of action, but he's not some sort of contrived macho character. There's something about him that's profoundly sad. There's a real um, inherent kind of quality of sadness about him, and he's and he's haunted, so he's vulnerable. But when the chips come down, if one had to have a cop who was going to catch their case, they would want someone like Harry Bosch because he's he's relentless in his pursuit. He's a grinder, and he won't stop until until he closes the case and and, uh, and as Harry says closure is a myth right? and that's sort of his that's his mantra is that everybody counts or nobody counts and so when you have a guy who has a moral compass like that it's kind of hard to not cheer him on yeah. and you don't you don't even mind when you see him sort of step on his own tail a bit because that's he's he's human he's human yeah. he's he's uh, He's not cool in the way that that we, we sort of think. And uh, you know, different yeah, it's a different generation. <laughs> he's a medium cool. All right, he's not. He's not a superhero. He's just. He's a. He's a. He's a guy who's good at his job and and who cares. And so uh, the process of getting through that is for some pretty exciting storytelling. This is bullshit. This is my case.
I think we're done here. We're not done here. Not by a long shot. <laughs>